Good evening. Um, I'm Jim Gardner, Executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services here at the National Archives. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater uh, for tonight's special program with acclaimed historical artist, Mort Kunstler. Um, we're honored to have Mr. Kunstler here with us tonight, and uh, we'll shortly welcome him and uh, Laurie Norton Moffitt, director and CEO of the Norman Rockwell Museum, um, who will interview uh, uh, Mort on stage and take us on an illustrated journey through his distinguished career as America's premier historical artist. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with the uh, Congressional Battlefield Caucus. And I would like to thank our next speaker for suggesting bringing Mr. Kunstler uh, to the National Archives. Congressman Steve Israel represents New York's 2nd Congressional District, including the communities of Huntington, Babylon, Islip, Smithtown, and Oyster Bay. Uh, he was first sworn into Congress in, 20, uh, in 2001. Co the congressman is a member of the House leadership, serving as the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. In March of 2012, he was appointed to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council, serving with seven other members of Congress. With a serious passion for military history, uh, a congressman uh, formed the Congressional Battlefield Caucus during the 109th Congress and continues the tradition through today. Um, Israel has been a passionate and relentless advocate for veterans and military families uh, throughout his tenure in Congress. He served for four years on the House Armed Services Committee and has made nine visits to, uh, to U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Congressman Israel. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Jim Gardner, for the extraordinary work that uh, you do. Uh, and uh, I know that my dear colleague, uh, Roscoe Bartlett, a uh, representative from Maryland, is on his way. Votes just ended, so we're running a little bit late. But Roscoe told me that he was planning uh, to join us. It's uh, also great to be here with uh, Paul Hawk, who's the uh, chief of the American Battlefield Protection Program, and uh, Bill Vodra from the Civil War Trust. And my wonderful friend, uh, who many of you may not know, but I hope you will get to know, Tom Swazi. Uh, Tom was a county executive in my hometown uh, and uh, uh, ran for governor, uh, did an extraordinary job, but also has one of the deepest commitments to history and education that uh, I've ever seen. And he was the guy who actually introduced me uh, to uh, Mort. He just accompanied me to a, a trip that we uh, made to uh, Gettysburg. So Mort uh, being here today uh, is nothing that I did, or, or quite honestly, nothing that the archives did, but it is everything that Tom Swazi did to uh, bring him here. I'm going to be very brief because we want to hear from Mort. He's waiting backstage. He's excited to come out here, and you want to hear from him and not me. So let me make a, f a couple of quick points to set the stage for uh, Mort's uh, discussion. I'll tell you a story about how Congress operates uh, and how I fell in love with the uh, history of the Civil War. Uh, I have never claimed to be the smartest member of the United States Congress, although if you listen to some of my colleagues, you know the competition ain't that stiff. Uh, but uh, I do immodestly claim to be the most serious student of history and military history in particular. I am a voracious student of military history. I wrote a book on military history, which made history by itself as being one of the worst sellers ever on Amazon.com. Uh, I just love uh, history. And uh, here's how I became almost obsessed with the lessons of the Civil War. I used to be on the House Armed Services Committee. And I noticed something after several years on that committee. Generals and admirals would come in to testify, and they would read from their testimony, and it was usually fairly sterile and somewhat bland. But if you developed a kinship with them, if you built a relationship with them, if they began to feel some faith in you and have some confidence in your ability to listen to what they were saying and not repeat it to the media, they would give you the real deal. And so I would made a point after senior military officials would testify of getting to know them, having them come up to my office and visiting with them and having dinner with them or coffee. And I became friendly with uh, this one general, General uh, Bob Scales, who was the 
commandant of the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle. And he came to testify on Iraq. At the time, uh, mostly everything that we were doing in Iraq was going wrong. This was at the height of the violence and the insurrection. And Bob testified, and I called him up and said, Bob, would you mind coming to my office and talking a little bit more about your testimony? He said, sure, I'd love to. And he came to my office and closed the door. And I thought he was going to pull the drapes and take the phones off the hook. And he said, uh, Congressman, he said, do you want to know what's going wrong in Iraq? And I said, Bob, please tell me. He said, well, I would like to tell you, but uh, I'd have to take you. And I'd just been to Iraq literally a month before. Been there nine times. I said, General, I just came back from Iraq. I can't go there so soon. And he said, oh, no, Congressman. I don't want to take you to Iraq to understand Iraq. I want to take you to Gettysburg to understand Iraq. Because everything you need to know about strategy, doctrine, tactics, communication, operational art, everything you need to know about Iraq, I can show you in a day in Gettysburg. And so I went with him. And we spent a day there. And it changed my life. I mean, I, really, it changed my life. Because I came back understanding that the lessons of history really do repeat themselves and guide our future. Now, here's how Congress operates. So I decided, based on that visit, Jim, to Gettysburg, that I was going to form the House Civil War Caucus. You know, we have caucuses on almost everything. And that's OK. You know, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, you have areas of interest. Some arcane and some significant. If you have an area of interest, you try and get like-minded members of Congress to focus on those areas. So I decided I was going to form the House Civil War Caucus to teach my colleagues the lessons of the Civil War so that they would understand what we needed to do in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. And I was getting a great response. I was getting Democrats and Republicans, conservatives, liberals. Great response. People were signing up for the House Civil War Caucus like crazy. And then I realized that I committed a mortal sin. I had forgotten to ask the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee, Ike Skelton, who was my boss on the committee, to join my House Civil War Caucus. And that's a serious blunder, because as you know, everything in Congress is based on seniority. And so I found Ike on the floor one day. Some of you may remember. Ike was just the greatest military historian in the Congress and the father of professional military education. I found him on the floor one day. And I sat next to him. I said, Ike, you know, I'm, I'm, I have like a, a total of three terms under my belt. Ike has a total of three decades under his belt. I said, Ike, I have formed the Civil War Caucus, and I would like you to sign up for it. Now, Ike is from Missouri. And he sat next to me, and he peered over his glasses, and he said, Israel, I will join your Civil War Caucus when you call it the War of Northern Aggression Caucus. <laughs> and so we talked about it, and uh, we compromised. And today it is known as the Civil War Battlefield <laughs> Caucus. So you don't have to pick sides. Final point about Mort. Uh, I have uh, proudly hanging in my office uh, his uh, uh, rendition of uh, Chamberlain at Little Round Top. Tom Swazi and I visited Little Round Top just a few weeks ago. And uh, it's just a marvelous, marvelous painting of uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the 20th Maine at Little Round Top and that moment where Chamberlain was reported to have uh, simply said, fix bayonets, charge. And when people come into my office, and I don't care who they are, constituents or my colleagues or candidates, and they talk about how hard things are and what an uphill battle it's going to be, and how rough it is. I point to that painting and say, we, have, we got it easy. Look what they had to deal with. That's hard. What we deal with, it's easy. If they can do that, we can do this. And so I'm very happy to say that Mort Kunstler inspires me every single day and inspires my colleagues and uh, people who come into my office. It is a, uh, a unique privilege uh, to be able to represent Mort uh, and uh, to reflect uh, his, central, uh, his central mission. Uh, and that is preservation. Our future is guided by the preservation of the past. And nobody has preserved the past in more visible and more dramatic and more compelling forms uh, than Mort Kunstler. Thank you for spending the evening with him. Uh, I know that uh, you're going to learn a lot. Thank you all very much. Uh, 
Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the participants in our program this evening. Uh, Mort Kunstler is a uh, leading contemporary painter of Civil War scenes. His work is valued for its dramatic intensity and for an extraordinary level of authenticity based on extensive historical research. He studied art at Brooklyn College, UCLA, and the Pratt Institute worked as an illustrator for Newsweek, Saturday Evening Post, Mad Magazine, and Boy's Life, and then moved to depictions of historical topics uh, for National Geographic. A commission from CBS TV to do artwork for the mini miniseries of Blue and the Gray uh, sparked his close association with the Civil War. Uh, joining him on the stage this evening will be Laurie Norton Moffat, uh, she is director, CEO of the Norman Rockwell Museum. Um, Ms. Norton Moffat is a leading Rockwell scholar and authored Norman Rockwell, A Definitive Catalog. She oversaw the expansion of the Norman Rockwell Museum, which opened its new Robert A.M. Stern building in 1993. Uh, during her tenure, she has invited a national reconsideration of Rockwell in the American art history canon and initiated discourse on the role of American illustration in the nation's visual culture. Uh, she is the founding vision behind the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies, a scholar's research program of the Rockwell Museum. Uh, now, uh, be joined by Mr. Kunstler and Ms. Norton Moffat. Well, Mort, we're going to have a conversation tonight about your art and your life and I think the history of this country. Uh, you are considered America's foremost painter of historic and heroic subjects. And you have painted and learned the history of this nation from the Revolutionary War to the space shuttle flying up into the, into the sky. Uh, you've painted from the depths of submarine on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, to the moon, and you are especially known for your uh, work chronicling the Civil War and being a, a painter of America's history. So let's see where it all began when you were a child in Brooklyn and how you came to be the painter of this country's history. Okay. So we have some early drawings. You want to tell us about sure, these? Well, uh, whether I was fortunate, I don't know, but I was a sickly kid, and it, it kept me in... Uh, in my room and uh, in my bed. And this is a, a very early drawing that I did of my room from, from the bed, as you could see. I think I was probably about six years old at the time. And um, there were a few other pictures on uh, the... Um, when did you discover that you liked to, to draw and, um, you know, really, were you always given art supplies? How I, did you come to be... Uh, you know, having, well, a, having these early sketches and keeping them all your life. Well, I think that the, uh, um, I showed a talent at an early age. My father, uh, uh, the name Kunstler means artist in German. Artist, yes. So uh, obviously it goes back and I have uh, my genes to be uh, thankful for. And my mother encouraged me. This, this picture we're looking at is also a childhood uh, picture. The first time I ever painted a picture it was a copy of a painting that was on the wall in, uh, in our house. And, for some reason, oh. my father had original art in the house, too. Small little paintings by unknown artists. And he was an amateur artist. So and, um, when did you actually start your art training? Did you train formally in school? Well, uh, I certainly did. I went through uh, three different uh, colleges uh, specializing in art. Uh, this picture is an another childhood a picture that's interesting. Growing up in Brooklyn, I uh, was a big Dodger fan. And uh, I used to copy the pictures out of the newspapers of the uh, Dodgers. And I finally put them all together in a, an 18 by 24 sheet. And through some sort of circumstances, via an uncle who knew one of the ball players, I was uh, allowed into the clubhouse. And they all picked their images out and signed them. 
So this picture is probably one of my most valuable paintings because it's got the signatures of Hall of Fame <laughs> guys on there. It's and that's doubly sort of famous. I did a whole bunch of them for three years running. Well, I, I understand your father wanted to raise you both as an artist and an athlete. How do you feel um, that, or do you feel that your athleticism helped you understand the adventure scenes that you came to paint later in life? I, I think that um, I certainly had an athletic uh, career, uh, but I really don't know. I don't know. I think I have a feel for action without question. I uh, gain that. These pictures we're looking at here, are uh, the one before in the suit of armor was a... Uh, a, uh, a picture uh, that I painted in the, uh, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, when I was going to Pratt. And the following picture uh, shows me on a trip um, uh, that, uh, uh, where I went to Mexico and painted a watercolor every day. I rode around Mexico on a bicycle, as a matter of fact, and stopped on the road. Here's another watercolor that was done in uh, Veracruz, as I remember. And um, we, I ended up very adept at... Um, at watercolor at the end of the summer. I did at least one watercolor every day. You did a picture day. a day? And I was in, in great physical shape besides because Mexico is just up one mountain one and down another, another. And <laughs> up and down. This is There's another a... watercolor from Mexico of uh, the city or town of Tosco. That's a very famous uh, spot. It was a very famous tourist spot at one mm -hmm. time. So when you and finished your, your years, your time in Mexico and finished art school, you began to work for the magazines. Uh, tell I, us a little bit about what illustration art was like at that time in the publishing world and for artists and, and what kind of commissions you received. Well, uh, the natural thing I wanted was to paint pictures for a living. It was the only uh, goal I had. And I just figured out that if I went for the least expensive art uh, or looked and saw where art was done where I felt I could do better, I would show my samples to the art director. And at that time, the men's adventure field was burgeoning, you might say, and it had a whole hierarchy of its own. At the top of the line was a True Magazine that uh, had writers. This, this is a true illustration, an illustration for True. It was my very first one, as a matter of fact. And uh, they uh, had writers like uh, Ernest Hemingway and, and um, uh, Sax Romer, uh, and um, it was quite prestigious. Uh, to mm -hmm. get there. And then they had the lower end. Uh, 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 I worked my way up through that mm -hmm. system, so to speak, and, and to, to where I was do, doing uh, fairly well with it. And this I did book covers as well. This became and a very... sports became something. Another area of, um, of um, painting was the box covers for the plastic kit companies, like Aurora Plastics. This picture of an F6F uh, Wildcat from World War II is just symbolic of a whole bunch that I did of almost every aircraft that ever flew. So this might have been the beginning of the historical accuracy and attention to detail that you had to give so. to paint these so I never realized it at so the time. Accurately. I, yes, I yes. think it uh, probably is so. Hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the, these uh, pictures are um, of uh, the uh, so, men so, from UNCLE, and they were also <laughs> box covers for um, uh, uh, Aurora Plastics. At the same time. I did, I think, more of those than any other artist, about 70 or 80 of them. And uh, they've become a collectible now. Uh, I guess if you stick around long enough, uh, the works are collected by people. They're all collected. So this men's adventure category of art, um, who was reading that? Who was the audience for this work? Well, uh, here, here we go again with a, uh, uh, <laughs> more of the plastic uh, uh, covers. But um, this is a sort of part of the subject matter. Uh, outdoor life, I believe, still exists. And the subject matter was such that you had to be good at certain things. And the more varied you were, the better off you were. So what did you so have I to be good So I became pretty good at? with bears. Bears, I know. And, Look at this um, bear. Look uh, I became good with the, the, the big cats. And that was a big category. And um, uh, there was sports afield that I did a lot of work mm -hmm. for. There was outdoor life. Ooh, and, then I was, and then there was then pulp I, fiction, And then I yes. became very good at bears, B-A-R-E-S. <laughs> so that added another category. This was another category. Between the two bears that I was uh, working away. And, um, and this anyway, was a very uh, um, popular genre at the time, the, the pulp fiction and all of the absolutely. This, of that time. This is a typical one, uh, aviation, again, mm -hmm. which was box cover, so it fit naturally. And... A picture of this type, you can, if you could divide the picture in half, 
uh, you would see where there was room for the fold and there were blank areas for the copy and text. So divining, the, designing these illustrations was not an easy task. And it was uh, more or less the same problems Michelangelo faced, believe it or not, except his page size was different. <laughs> he had to fit into and those uh, ceiling poppers like down, up right. here. So you were given direction. You had to leave room for the copy. You had to make it fit the layout you, of you the, had to, uh, the box. You had to allow magazine. for the fold so that there was mm -hmm. nothing of a special interest right in the middle. You had to allow for the title and the copy and uh, making it dramatic. And I just sort of felt that uh, if I could make it as exciting as possible, that was the key to it. So and it led from one picture to another. Uh, World War II was a very popular subject. Yes, you did many in the world of the World War II inspired stories. Was this a popular subject matter in the literature at the time that you were painting? I, I would say that um, it was certainly popular with the uh, men's adventure magazines, that the titles, uh, the stories also ran in other magazines, mm -hmm. so I use it as a broad term. I did some work for the Saturday Evening Post for Good Housekeeping and uh, uh, American Weekly I did an awful lot of work mm -hmm. for, and I was always called on for some reason to do the mystery, or I guess I had a knack for it. But World War II was a very popular subject with the readers. And uh, uh, without uh, trying to name drop, uh, Mario Puso, the, the famous author of The Godfather, mm -hmm. uh, was an editor. And uh, we were quite uh, friendly. And he used to say that World War II was the good war. Not for any moral reasons, but that it sold. People wanted to read the stories. <laughs> and yeah. uh, he said that Korea was the bad war and Vietnam was the bad war. But it was strictly readership and what they wrote back about that he was interested in. At the well, time. and the other aspect that was changing during those later wars was television was taking readership away from the magazines and well, changing well, the field considerably, well, wasn't that, it? That certainly changed everything. Uh, television money uh, went, uh, uh, the, the money that went into uh, the print media uh, was now going into television. The so people were starting yes. to get their fiction over television. Hmm. And this is a, a string of uh, World War II uh, uh, pictures that we're looking at now. And I always did seek accuracy, of course. And, mm -hmm. and it was fairly easy because the, the armed forces had public relations officers, and I always found their office. And they helped me in whatever way they uh, could. And the Marines were especially good. They, I remember one time they sent a Marine over with a, uh, gee, a, a M1 or a, well, I forget. And, hmm. Uh, I also, to make sure the pictures were authentic, I began collecting uh, weapons and, and costumes. I had all sorts That's of That's a great tradition props. for many artists, to have a costume collection or the oh. props and objects. Norman Rockwell did, for example. Well, and so you, you have such varied subject matter. What kinds of costumes and well, props do you have? Well, for the World War II period, I had uh, whatever I could. I'd go to gun shows and buy them. and. Um, as a matter of fact, I uh, even had a Tommy gun at one time, which was a, oh, became yeah. illegal. And I, but I, I eventually <laughs> sold um, the Kunstler sold Arsenal. The, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, it, it makes it so much easier to make it authentic, of mm -hmm. course. And uh, uh, it was uh, kind of fun. But I sold all of it once I stopped doing the World War mm -hmm. II illustrations. They sat in a storeroom until I said, "What do I need this Someone for?" And there are always people that, or them. dealers that are willing to come and and buy whatever you have. Collect, so. other collectors, and, yes. Uh, I have not collected Civil War uh, stuff uh, at all. Just, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. I have quite a number of mm -hmm. weapons, of course I have. Hmm. Right. Um, this is uh, a World War II, uh, again, this is a picture of D-Day. The one before was a different layout, the uh, one with the red background that we just saw. Uh, that was a, a, a vertical picture of uh, Zero's uh, kamikaze planes attacking an mm. American battleship. It's a vertical because that was a paperback cover. And uh, the paperback so company saw these illustrations and called me and so I did various covers for them. Let's talk times. about that a little bit, the range of uh, media, if you will, that your images were reproduced on. You had the magazines, the paperback books, the box um, covers you were talking about, any other kinds of well, I did some uh, advertising, but not very much. Uh, uh, just about it. I was not soliciting work anymore, and people would you come were, to me. I understand you were working 12, 16-hour days for a while. Yeah. Uh, uh, like record for, for many me was, years. I guess, uh, every, uh, every day for six or seven weeks, uh, 12 mm. hours minimum. That's 
a long time. That's a long time. But I, I have to say that I really loved it, and uh, it was almost a compulsion. I couldn't believe I was making a living painting pictures, first of all. Mm -hmm. And I was just afraid it was going to go away. So it was never a deadline I would miss. But I, I understand just, there was a time uh, when your family said, we need some of you, your time as well. And you were able to balance your work patterns a little more after that. Well, that led to uh, uh, Debbie had bought, uh, Debbie, can you stand up? Okay, <laughs> all right, uh, she's here. Uh, she Welcome was ready to leave me and, uh, because it was just ridiculous. She had bought tickets for a show in New York and it was a Saturday night probably and I said, I can't, I've got to work tonight and tomorrow and she really got angry at me and I, we went to the show and I found out that on Monday that I was supposed to deliver the painting on Monday and I called on Monday morning and said, do you want it? today or, uh, 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 and bad or tomorrow and, and good and uh, so they gave me an extra day and I, I really worked hard all day Sunday and Sunday night I couldn't make it and I got it in there on Tuesday delivered it and they called and they gave me another painting to do and they gave me another urgent deadline and two weeks later I came in with a cover painting for uh, Argosy I think it was and uh, there was the cover that was in such distress and so late still sitting on an easel in his office. I began to realize that these guys were just covering themselves and making sure they were not going to be late for the printer. So I began to um, realize that uh, it wasn't life or death all the time. So I think this believe them. was an important turning point for you, actually, to mm -hmm. gain better life balance, have time for your family, your children, yes. and still be the fabulous artist and yes. in demand that you were by that time. Yes. Yes. And I, I, I think, you know, I worked a lot with Norman Rockwell's life and career, and he too was compelled to paint all the time, and hardly took time out for birthdays or Christmas, and was back to the studio. And I think that's a quality of our best artists, that they're just oh. driven to paint, and it's what you do, and it's what you love, and uh, it's, I'm sure, wonderful that your family understands that. And well, what it led to was a great adventure for us, because we finally... Uh, uh, decided that uh, I w uh, people were seeking my work so so much, and I was only in the field about 10 years, we moved to Mexico. We had been there on our honeymoon and liked it. We'd been there on an, uh, an auto trip uh, the following summer. We took off, and then once we started to have children, we said, gee, this, it's not necessary to paint all the time. And we literally moved down there. And how long did you live there? And we lived there for uh, almost two years with mm -hmm. our three children. And it's probably some of the happiest adventure. days we ever had. <laughs> and um, we began to realize, though, that we were going to be foreigners. Mm -hmm. Our kids were starting to talk in Spanish to each other. <laughs> and uh, they would play under the dining room and table. And you couldn't understand them. Spanish. Huh? <laughs> no, I, I, I spoke Spanish pretty well. I could understand them all right. But I uh, think that there was just a sense that we had to go had back to home. Back. And when we moved, we said we were going to give it from six months to forever. And the six months turned into a year couple and of half years. Or so. And what year was that that you were there? 1961 mm -hmm. to 63. So that was another, um, these are just a few more of your adventure. This one scenes. was for um, uh, Sad Evening Post. Uh, a little more family wholesome style there. Yeah, <laughs> but it was the same period. And this is a here's sports of field cover. Uh, you could see the title. Uh, uh, if you could imagine it saying sports a field across the top area, that's why it's sort of blank up on the mm -hmm. top. So you're charging Tiger. This was an interesting picture. Of, it's the Homestead Steel Strike, and it was done for uh, True Magazine, which is sort of the top of the line of the adventure uh, magazines. And it was a very famous strike and famous in, in Union history. Uh, and um, the Pinkertons... Uh, uh, broke the strike with the uh, Winchesters. They came up in a barge, just the way you see it. It was one of the early paintings I did that you can see the hallmark of a lot of my work today, where it's sort of putting little pieces together and creating a lot of different characters. A lot of activity and going on. And that's uh, kind of what I love to do, I think. And I noticed in your work people. that your people are very individualized. They're, they're each a different person. They're not yeah. a type. You take the time to paint individual faces. Well, I, I, I use the same model for every picture, interestingly, and I change their builds, I change their 
Um, I, I'll use whatever it takes to, to get to the final result. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the creative part of making up the characters is something part I really of the story cherish telling. to this day. And I love painting pictures of famous personalities and angles that no photo exists. And it's, a, I guess, a, something that interests me a great deal. We'll and talk about pretty that proficient at in one of your pictures coming up. Now, this this was, is another this wor World me. War II uh, picture. This was for Argosy, another very good magazine. Uh, I remember, I don't think it was Philip, no, Philip Wiley was... Uh, well, I understand that the two. Secret Can Service I? came to you to no. commission right. this. yes, yes. Tell us about uh, that. Well, what, what it was was a story illustration, and uh, it was exhibited in a show, um, oh, some gallery or, or a college uh, university, I think, a gallery, on World War II, on the anniversary of World, World War II, mm -hmm. and this was one of the pictures. And shortly after, I got a call from the Secret Service. And I said, what did I do? I mean, you hear from the Secret <laughs> Service. And, I, and it turned out that it's the first time they'd ever seen a picture of counterfeiting. And this was a famous case that they had, and that had, they had broken uh, successfully. Hmm. And they inquired about it. And, and they ended up actually uh, two of the, or, or a group of Secret Service men bought it and then eventually gave it as a gift to the Secret Service, and it hangs in Washington How remarkable. at the I, headquarters to this day. And I understand and, you told them you had a little bit of experience with okay, counterfeiting and shook them up for a moment. Oh, yes. oh, well, they took me out to dinner. Boy, you're remembering my dark past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they took me out to dinner, and um, they were telling me about the case and, and uh, how excited they were. And prints were made, 150 limited edition prints were made. I think there were 150 offices hmm. in the Secret Service at that time in the United States. And they uh, uh, had a print so made for each office. office, and I signed them. And they brought me down to Washington for a presentation. And, I still couldn't get over this, and a Secret Service man accompanied me down to Washington, and I couldn't get over it, but it seems that that was the only way I could go is if a Secret Service man uh, took me hmm. and uh, accompanied me. And later, after the presentation, and, uh, they took me out to dinner, and I said, you know, I was a counterfeiter once, and their jaws dropped, you know, <laughs> and they really said, "Oh no, but he doesn't realize." They told me later. Now they thought he doesn't that's realize that he, he he's going to be accountable for everything he says. We're going to have to lock this guy up. I said, "Yeah, you know, when I was about eight years old, uh, they had the Knothole Club uh, at Ebbets Field for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and they had little cards for the kids that they gave out in school, and I." Would, uh, they were color coded. One would be yellow, one would be pink, one would be blue. And if your best friend had a blue one and you had a pink one, you couldn't go to the game together. So I got cardboard and I put watercolor on and I, I counterfeited the knot hole tickets. And then I finally made it into a business. I, 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 got a, I probably got a penny. Or, I once said I got a dime to one of my friends. I said, Are you kidding? Who had a dime? And, so it might have been a nickel, I don't know. <laughs> but that was my counterfeiting job, so they all relaxed after that. So you're I okay. Was, I let you keep painting. Well, we um, see your work change a little bit in the 1960s, quite a lot, actually. You took an assignment with National Geographic, and you had a completely different kind of commission than you'd had previously. Well, um, the experience uh, was totally different in that uh, a, a true magazine always wanted the truth and as accurate as possible, but within limitations. Uh, I could go to New London to get on board a submarine and hmm. see what it looked like if it was a submarine scene. But the geographic would s go to no, I mean, there was nothing they would do that, that would uh, cost too much. They would send you anywhere no to get it right. And this picture that we're looking at is uh, the discovery of uh, San Francisco Bay. Uh, a Spanish expedition of, with Mexican soldiers, soldados de cuera, uh, leather jacketed soldiers and leather armor, marched up from Mexico aiming for Monterey and overshot Monterey. And uh, in fact, any of you who have been to San Francisco might be familiar with Portola Boulevard. This is Gaspar de Portola uh, discovering the uh, San Francisco Bay, and that's Mount Diablo across the bay. And um, I actually visited the site, which uh, the marshland that you see in the painting overlooks uh, the airport at San Francisco to this day, of course. And um, 
I then went to Tucson, Arizona to consult with an authority on the uh, leather jacketed armor mm -hmm. and the uh, uniforms. He was the expert on that exp uh, expedition. And uh, it, what resulted from that is I presented the geographic uh, painting before I delivered it to an agent uh, by the name of Laverty, Frank Laverty, and Frank and Jeff Laverty uh, uh, were, became my agents uh, for art. And uh, it, it put me into the world of advertising art. Hmm. There are thousands of advertising agencies all over, and there's no way that an artist is going to be uh, uh, able to solicit for that kind of work. And it was always a very desirable field. In Norman Rockwell's day, they vowed to not do advertising. They thought it was not the right thing to do. Uh, they felt story illustration was more important than when there were story illustrations to do. Well, we have some but, advertising art coming up. Let's go to it. And, well, this, um, this is an interesting piece here, the advertising art, because it brings back my old friend Mario Puso. Uh, this picture was done for the Literary Guild, which I don't know if they exist or not. I don't know if the Book of the Month Club exists anymore. Oh, I, I live in such an isolated uh, It's probably zone. downloaded electronically but, now. But uh, this is, uh, the movie came out in 73, and uh, I uh, did the very first pictorial version of The Godfather for, I think it was Mail Magazine, who hmm. Mario was a, an editor hmm. for. And then when uh, the book was picked up by the Literary Guild, uh, I created this character after reading the script. The first one was done out of a, off a paragraph. Totally different character. But I think you could see uh, this was done in 69, the movie in 73. And I was told that uh, this was the criteria for the Marlon Brando the model character. For the, and I think you can see film. it in there. So yeah. it's kind of a, a unique picture that I well, had a I, lot of fun. I think uh, that's interesting looking. about your work, that you were working at a time that you were in, working in the intersections of film and print and books and television, wow. uh, product, advertising, and yeah. that illustration was inspiring and, and infusing all of those media. And you were moving back and forth uh, in this, all the so. different genres. I always thought of them as painting pictures. It didn't matter. Where <laughs> I just love doing uh, this. Uh, Newsweek uh, used me a good number of times. And they would not use art very uh, often. But it was usually when uh, there was an event that took place and they could not get photographs. They mm -hmm. would almost always want to use a photograph. And they wanted their own photograph. So they would not use a stock photo. Mm -hmm. So that um, in this particular situation, obviously, uh, you couldn't get a photograph right. uh, like that. Uh, this is a natural for a Newsweek cover. Uh, and I think there are some others uh, coming up. This, uh, interestingly, was Th this in, in the 70s. This could be as contemporary and, as today, yeah, sadly. Yeah, exactly. And this was the, um, the West Little German at the time raid on Mogadishu, where mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, hijackers had uh, landed an airliner. Mm -hmm. And they went in. Uh, the, the art director at, at um, Newsweek always called it the Entebbe raid, but it wasn't. Hmm. It was the Entebbe-like raid on Mogadishu by the West Germans. And it was more successful, actually, because they killed all the terrorists but did not wound a single hmm. passenger that was held hostage. And I figured out how they did it by going to the airport and, and, and getting permission on, on an angle that would be dramatic for that cover. And I hmm. could see just how... The, the, uh, the, the West Germans came up from the rear. There was a blind spot from the cabin, even with mm. the mirror, where you could single file come up and then come and out. And that's the under. angle you And I didn't take that exact angle, from. but I realized that was the way mm. it was done. This is an interesting picture. It was done in 1975 for the bicentennial of our country. It appeared on the, uh, in 1976. It was on the cover of Army magazine. That was, uh, I know, still published today. And mm -hmm. I was down to Washington to confer with them on it. it was, and it was also used as a limited edition print. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, this is a painting that uh, Debbie owns. And it's, it's a very oh. masculine looking picture, I think, a kind that uh, men well, would be. It's a very patriotic uh, would appeal, picture. Appeal to. But she just happened to love that picture. And mm -hmm. she, nice. she took it out of a very early show of mine. And well, we have a few. Um, <laughs> Uh, end of the magazine era images to well, look through here. Th this is a, a kind of interesting story. The, <laughs> uh, I was called via my agent uh, uh, to do a, a MAD uh, magazine cover. 
And I said, come on, I'm not going to do that. But, uh, <laughs> stuff. And I turned him down, and at, at dinner that night, I, I um, um, mentioned it, and Jane was at the table, and uh, Jane, can you raise your hand? Hi, Jane. <laughs> <I call her. laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, um, she, when she heard I turned down a mad cover, she almost got She's hysterical. Oh, Dad. <laughs> she said, I could have been the, you know, the, the big shot in high school. And, <laughs> and, uh, and she practically cried, so I, I called him back and said, hey, get, get me a cover, but I'm going to do it under a different name. And uh, I, I worked under a lot of different So what names, names do, have you painted under? I painted under Emmett K, which is my initials, Emmett K, M, K. I painted under Martin K, I guess, and Mort Kunstler, and Mutz. So who did this? Mutz. Mutz, Mutz did this? Yeah, <laughs> M-U-T-Z. And they did a parody of this cover. It became a sort of an iconic And what year was of, this? Do you uh, remember? Mad Magazine did a parody of it themselves in a, in a special issue. And they, they had the signature as nuts. 1976. So, yeah. so um, did this And they must have done it at you know, the end of a decade or so. It was picked out. I'm a, trying to remember if this preceded or followed Jaws. I oh, think. this was, of course, after Jaws, <laughs> right. And uh, what happened is I recognized, by the way, that that would have collectible value. Finally, I began to realize that the originals mm. would have some sort of collectible value. And I would have done them, actually, because they paid me very well and they were fun. But they refused to return the uh, art, so I said, forget mm. it. And um, the You're advertising art, of course, I had no art. back to bears. <laughs> <laughs> See, everything comes, comes but, into but, hand. But what's interesting is each one of these pictures recognizes, uh, you have to realize, represents literally 100 or 200 similar images. I did, uh, I can't say I did uh, 100 billboards, but I certainly did a couple of dozen. You do uh, here are some of the, the movies that I've done uh, yeah. that were very much sought after. They were uh, uh, very much um, sought after by almost every illustrator. They first of all went worldwide. And they, now, did you watch these very well movies before you did the art? Did you watch the movies before you created these well, movie posters? Well, some of or? them we watched a half hour or 20 minute synopses. Trailers? Uh, yeah, I guess you'd call them trailers. And uh, the one we're looking at became so popular that it was redone. Hmm. You take Napellum 1, 2, 3, so, same with the, uh, the Poseidon Adventure. But we would watch sometimes. I understand this is a, a, a bit of a classic uh, mm -hmm. uh, too. For, uh, it has a bunch of uh, people that are interested in it. But uh, they, they were just what they were. They were a lot of fun, and they sure paid the bills. Mm -hmm. And I always enjoyed doing them. This changed This was a real me, turning but, point painting for you, wasn't it, Mort? Well, this was an assignment, as I recall, from Reader's Digest as a test project for an Indian book. And it changed things for me because of the subject matter. And no one, uh, it was going to be a series of paintings on uh, ceremonials that had never really been done before, rare ceremonials. And this is called a, a potlatch ceremony where one tribe of the Haida Indian the Northwest Coast arrived uh, at another village. And mm -hmm. um, it just happened by coincidence, I had the painting under my arm wrapped up. And I went to a show at Hammer Galleries. And um, a friend of mine had a show there. And um, I went to see the show. And the salesman came over to me and said, what have you got there? Uh, uh, I'd been, to, he, he knew me by sight, but didn't know I was an artist. I said, it's painting. He knew it was a painting. He said, who did it? I said, I, did, he said, I didn't know you did, uh, you did artwork. Let me take a look at it. And um, I, we unwrapped it. And uh, without any premeditation, this was pure coincidence. And he took it back to the uh, director of the gallery, who uh, showed him this painting. And the director came out. And I, I learned later that you know, you, it would take two years to, to get a date the to see the guy to come even. See your work. And he, we chatted for a while, and he thought it was really good. And I got a call from him a couple of uh, days later asking me if I had any other uh, work available. And I had some Western uh, paperbacks. So I brought them in, and uh, we talked. And he offered a, a show, uh, as I recall, which changed my career because mm -hmm. I was with Hammer Galleries. For, so this is when you I began guess, showing in galleries, and some of the Western work you were painting right. was now being and, collected. Uh, uh, all of these paintings were really done uh, as commissions or sold, were done to be made into prints and then sold by the galleries. Mm -hmm. It sort of reversed itself. And 
instead of doing illustrations and getting the right subject matter that would work and be sold in a gallery, all of a sudden it, re it reversed itself where I was painting just for the gallery. Mm -hmm. And uh, then people were commissioning me. And people were buying the paintings yeah, then and not right, the Right, exactly. Uh, this was the beginning of a, a series of, of one of a better word I called Epic Paintings of America, where I tried to do a series of uh, uh, paintings of, of famous events mm -hmm. in history. This is Custer's Last Stand. And, I went out to the site on my own rather than um, uh, via National Geographic sponsorship, mm -hmm. did the research. And it was called by the historian out there the, uh, the best and most exciting and accurate Custer mm -hmm. ever done. But it was a very difficult road to go down because mm -hmm. Custer had been done a thousand times. And uh, I went on uh, to do um, the fall of the Alamo. I don't know if we have this. Uh, um, uh, this this is uh, not I part of that series. I want to go back to this because um, I think that um, was this but, the, uh, there's the there, fall of well, the Alamo. Well, here's the fall yeah. of the Alamo. Thank and you. again, people have done it so many times. And then suddenly I ended up um, uh, doing a, a painting for the uh, 125th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's called the High Water Mark. I, I don't know if that would be well, it's, I think the it's one that's coming, uh, along a little bit coming up. Later. But, um, uh, I somehow, I bumped into, again, a coincidence. In doing my research, I met a uh, publisher of limited edition prints in Gettysburg who was familiar with my work from uh, Hammer Galleries mm -hmm. and from uh, several books that had come out on my work previously. And he um, said that he would publish this painting that didn't exist that I was doing the research on. Hmm. And I did this uh, battle scene that became a very famous uh, picture or print, and, and it led to my Civil War career, which is not Which we're going to look at in a moment. We... These Western pieces, you've been likened to Frederick Remington and Charles Russell. Um, how did you get the authenticity and feel of the West of a uh, well, century I, ago? Well, I've, I've been out there. Uh, quite a few times. I literally rode over uh, the Bighorn Mountains on horseback. Um, three days and three nights mm -hmm. camping out. And I happened to be, uh, sounds crazy, a kid from Brooklyn growing up to be a woodsman. Or wood, uh, you became a cowboy, woodsman. is that it? But I live in uh, wooded property mm -hmm. and I've, uh, uh, you know, I do everything by hand. I, I, mm -hmm. I cut with a bow saw and, <laughs> and keep a wood burning stove going all the winter and, and split my own wood with a, a maul. And I, 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 on this trip over the Bighorn Mountains, they thought they had uh, you know, some greenhorn, I guess. That I, we went over with a, um, someone that had invited me on this trip. And uh, the, 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 the wrangler, I guess, who took care of the horses when we made camp. Um, one guy would take care of the horses, and the other w would set up the tent. And I said, I'll get the fire going. And um, they figured uh, this was going to be a lost cause. They know they'd have to start the fire. <laughs> So I very carefully set the fire up and happened there was some, uh, it was a previous uh, campsite. And we were the first ones over the Bighorn Mountains uh, that summer, July 15th. And the way you know is you get it to snow, snow and there's no footprints. And uh, anyway, I could see that they knew we picked out the site because it had been a site, but no one realized it had been used the, the night before. And I uh, took some newspaper and very carefully prepared the ashes and put some uh, pine needles down to make sure it was good. Then I said, hey, uh, Carl, uh, uh, you got some matches. I don't smoke. So he flipped me a matchbook. And he said, you sure that'll be enough? You know. <laughs> I, I started to see a little bit of a, a wisp of smoke. And I knew I could start it with my hat. But I said, on second thought, Carl, Forget it. I don't need any. I went like that. <laughs> they, never, they never got over that one. But I gained a lot from those experiences that gave me a sense of, of uh, actions that you could do and little stories within stories that you could do. Mm -hmm. And I went and I waded through rivers and, you know, whatever. So you became the adventurer to well, it was a lot study of these works. Now, this uh, was interesting. You uh, these uh, are took all on a whole new uh, genre. Yeah, the, the farm series uh, started as uh, one picture that was commissioned by a gallery, interestingly, the first time I ever had been commissioned by a gallery. And um, it led to a bunch of uh, farm paintings. 
of the old uh, era, a horse-drawn era, that led to where we're, to this day we have a, a Mort Kinsler farm calendar that hmm. comes out every year, hmm. and uh, along with several other. Some kinds. more of your Western These works. are some of the Westerns that were done uh, for galleries. Oh, we jumped another to another adventure era here. <laughs> from, um, from my show, I had a first show at Hammer Galleries in 77, quite successful. Second one was in 79, and that was also uh, sold out. And what really became a success from that, though, was that the chairman of the board of Rockwell International, who was an art collector, uh, and was also on the board of uh, Grand Central Galleries at the time, a rival of Hammer, uh, actually, uh, saw the show and asked me to go to dinner and asked me uh, if I would be interested in painting uh, pictures documenting the space shuttle. Hmm. And at that time, I, no one had ever so heard of it. I had not the heard West. of it. The I thought it was a plane that rode back and forth from, from Boston to New York. And, <laughs> uh, and, and suddenly um, you're he explained into to this. me, that I said, What's the name? Because everything had been Apollo and had different names. And it ended up as another big adventure. And hmm. uh, we did about 30 or 40 pictures for them, only about maybe six or 10. Uh, finished oils, but a lot of studies Remarkable. and sketches. And then we had the great excitement of seeing the first launch of the Columbia and the first touchdown, mm -hmm. which took some doing because launched in Florida. And, took, and then you had to get to California to, to, to record California, the landing. So that yeah. was good. This is, has, well, we're has jumping a, around here a bit, but we're back to... Well, um, well, this is very meaningful for me. This is part of a series that I did for the um, National Guard Bureau here in hmm. Washington. And it hangs in... The, in the, at the, at, at the Pentagon today. And uh, it's very dear to me because it's Theodore Roosevelt's charge up San Juan Hill. And I believe it's uh, more accurate, I've been told it is, uh, than Remington's version was. And Remington was there, hmm. went there, not to the battle, he didn't see the battle, knew Roosevelt. But um, he, well, for a number of reasons. But I also happened to live less than a mile from Sagamore Hill, from which is home. Theodore right. Roosevelt's home. So I was very excited to get this as an assignment. I don't think that the uh, major who ga uh, gave me that assignment uh, knew I lived Didn't realize that, that close to it. And uh, they brought the actual pistol. The hmm. actual pistol I held in my hand. Of course, to he was a great thing. outdoorsman and adventurer. Fun. Adventure this is part of that. Well. Uh, this is Oklahoma, the Oklahoma land rush, part of my epic mm -hmm. series. Yeah, that I'm moving through, going through a few now. so we can get to your Civil And War again, series. another commission and leading to uh, uh, my Civil War um, uh, era. This was 1980. So, how did your Civil War series start? You had gone from painting the West and painting uh, all different aspects of American history and adventure, and then you received a call from PBS. Was that how yes. your interest started? Yes, via my agent. Mm -hmm. uh, he changed, as I say, lavity. Uh, uh, this was the official logo for the, uh, for the CBS miniseries, The Blue and the Gray, that starred Gregory Peck and Stacy Keach, as I recall. And it was a symbolic kind of picture, and it led to a whole bunch of uh, this Civil led to War your paintings series, that I did. Which we're going we, to look at and a, we had a, a show at Hammer Galleries. And this is uh, the high water mark that I had talked about earlier that uh, I uh, did after being inspired by that first logo. And that's where the real Civil War um, started uh, because it was made into a print that mm -hmm. became very successful and very popular. So how did you do your research for I, these pictures? Well, well I, I think the, um, I learned from National Geographic right from the start that if there's something to see, go see it. So I would always try to go. If there was nothing to see, then I wouldn't go because it could be a city there and you'd have to reconstruct from maps or, mm -hmm. or um, uh, old engravings or whatever. But at Gettysburg, fortunately, it's been preserved. And that's what it's all about, is mm -hmm. to preserve our history right. and so that we can learn from the past. And uh, the Gettysburg battlefield is a very important element of preserving our history. And you read all the time about them looking to install a, a gambling casinos there. They have a, a Harley a Davidson. I have nothing wrong with uh, Harley Davidson motorcycles. But I think Gettysburg should be known for uh, why it is famous well, and why is Gettysburg really not as a, a, gamble, a gambling uh, a center. Uh, uh, so what we're talking about now is battlefield preservation, mm -hmm. which also has other consequences because everyone talks about battle, 
about preservation who's interested in it, but at the same time it aligns its, itself with conservation because uh, people don't realize this, but during the, the deer hunting season, which will be coming up this fall, uh, it, it is acting to, to not only protect the fields the way they were 150 years ago, but the deer come out of the woods when the hunting season opens up in Gettysburg and browse in the, in hmm. the fields in Gettysburg where picket charged. Hmm. And, uh, and they go back uh, to, to their safety zone and they know it and sense it. Hmm. So it's killing two birds with one stone. So it's two great causes that should be entwined, and I don't know if they both they recognize that. They aren't married that. yet. <laughs> they don't seem to. So this is a beautiful portrait of this Sojourner Truth. This is a painting I used, uh, uh, I used Debbie as a model for it, and uh, I, it started out as a paperback book cover. Uh, it was called, her name was Sojourner Truth, and uh, there are no, there's one photograph of Sojourner Truth, and I chose to romanticize her and, and uh, paint her as a young woman. The only photo is of her as about Oh, 70 or 75, and, and um, it, it, it's sort of a heroic uh, Very heroic. Uh, version. I well, these are all parts of my Civil War paintings. Going that, through the uh, seasons. Now, I want to talk about this very... one a moment, because what really struck me about it was your early adventure paintings and the, the, the struggle and the striving that you see in this picture, um, pulling these horses and... Um, cannons through the mud. How did you envision this? This was again a commission of the company that developed the land where this took place. This is called the Mud March. And it took place in Virginia, not far from here actually, um, in the Fredericksburg area. And um, the Union Army went out in the winter and they got hit by terrible weather and had a retreat. And um, this uh, real estate developer had bought the uh, prominent uh, developer, ha had uh, passed this through seven or eight different jurisdictions. Uh, he owned the property, and whatever anyone had an objection, he figured out a way to get it, uh, get it through. So that um, uh, if it was a golf course that he wanted to put up, he protected the area and, and promoted it. So he preserved the trail that they actually Travel on and made it into a sightseeing tour if you played golf there. And it was called the Cannon Ridge Golf Course. Well, it doesn't course look like a golf course. And in I this turned picture. it down when he asked me to paint it because when he described the mud march, it took me a year to figure out that I could make it into a dramatic picture. I just pictured mud color until I read about it and traveled that trail mm -hmm. through the mud and um, got a feel for it. And then I realized that you can make it very dramatic with the lightning and the animals uh, the, the, straining the, the, the through tremendous the... struggle. I consider it one of the best paintings I've ever it's, done. I almost it's didn't magnificent. do it. It's magnificent. I almost mm. didn't do it. It's sort of funny. I, I'll never forget when uh, Hammer uh, Galleries uh, was commissioned through Hammer Galleries with a client of theirs. And um, when he came in, I got the reaction I have always used as an expression now. They, they, he walked walked in, he looked at me, he went, wow. <laughs> and I was so thrilled with that. So yeah. now I always how, look how for a while. How large is it? What's it's, the it's size? It's a pretty big picture. It's about, um, uh, oh, I guess about uh, five feet. Uh, I think it's probably yeah, 60 inches. Yeah, I think it's important 40, for people to understand the feet, scale uh, you paint well, in. Four, four or five feet mm -hmm. wide. So this is this, another special commission. This is a submarine that has uh, just recently been found, if I'm yes. correct in remembering. Yes, uh, this is the uh, Confederate submarine Hunley that was mm. the first uh, submarine to succeed in sinking an enemy ship. And it became quite a, uh, a, a celebrity, you might say, of, of the uh, mm. war. The, it was found intact in the bottom of Charleston Harbor after Remarkable. searching for, for 140 years or so. And um, uh, this was, uh, well, it, it, it was, again, visiting the site, learning everything mm. about it. I was there, believe it or not, on the day that they actually uh, opened the watch mm. of the commander, Commander Dixon, who's looking at the watch because they had to catch mm. the time for the tide to go out, for them to, uh, to propel the boat. Mm. It was uh, hand propelled with a crank by eight men in this manner with a little oh uh, 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 tower, conning tower with a little glass viewing thing. And unfortunately, they, uh, it sunk after they sunk the uh, Housatonic, the Union ship. And it was a mystery, but the beauty of it was that um, 
if you can call anything of this type beauty, but um, it, it sunk in, in its entirety, and it was always a mystery of how it sunk. Mm. And it was so preserved by the way it sunk that the sand seeped in and didn't allow the crustaceans Preserved and all kinds it. of sea to destroy it to the point where the wooden bench that was all on one side of it, boat's about so high, you can, well, you can see about, I guess, the, the width of the stage here. That was the length of the boat, mm -hmm. about this wide. And um, they, uh, uh, the, the wooden bench that the men sat on, the edges of the wood were sharp, and there was still, still. white paint on it. And you could see the paint where it was worn away from their behinds. Oh, really I did not even cranking. know there were submarines during the Civil well, War. Well, it was the and first one, and one of the things very we, successful and very unsuccessful. I think we learned from they your paintings, uh, and we learn about history that maybe we didn't know about from the images you've created. Well, I learned a great deal about it. A little a note in this that of interest is uh, there's a little boat in the lower right foreground that had oysters in it. And, and uh, mm. Charleston did not suffer from um, hunger during the war because they were able to feed they off had the, the oysters. Uh, oysters and uh, seafood. This is... Uh, so I, we're I well, just wrapping up your Civil War series. I think you have uh, one example of a postage stamp that you uh, created, which is a great tradition of artists and the U.S. Postal Commissions of commemorative stamps. And I, uh, well, I, I, it's the only stamp I ever did, mm -hmm. and uh, anyone that says that the government wastes a lot of money, I am sure they uh, are correct, but they do not waste money on artists. <laughs> and, um, um, but it was a thrill and an honor. Moving to... right along, a case of Secret Service comes back now, Mark. Right. <laughs> This was a magnificent uh, memorial that you created, uh, counterpoint, I think, to some of your Civil, civil War uh, pictures. And can you tell us about it? It's in Ohio? Yes. It's a little we, hard uh, to see in this slide, but it's epic. It's the entire yes. history of our American military, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes. Uh, we, we got a call from um, uh, the, the, the town, I guess, sponsored it, of Middletown, Ohio. And they were sponsoring a, a memorial to all of the uh, people in, in peace or war who died from that area. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, it became a 60 foot long, uh, eight foot high black marble memorial. And they, those were two drawings that I did especially for it. They wanted to use a couple of my pieces in this design and it was very amateurish quite honestly, and I really didn't want to be associated with it. And they asked me if I would like to design it. And I said to myself, that sounds like a really interesting project. We'd never done anything like it before, but we figured out how to do it, and we made sort of um, illustration board replicas taped together mm -hmm. with black board, and used all of our art and made room for the names. And um, it became a project that was a very a worthwhile project uh, from an artistic standpoint, mm -hmm. certainly, and uh, so much so that we all flew out to, uh, to um, Middletown for the event, for the unveiling mm -hmm. on, July, on July 4th. I don't remember the year, moving. probably about five or ten years ago. Well, we have a series here that um, shows how you make a picture, and maybe you could walk us through your briefly your study stages for this piece that I understand is one of um, your public's most favorite image of yours, Brief Encounters. Right. Well, a lot of people think that these things just spring out from nowhere on a piece of canvas, but they really start with little scribbles, uh, thumbnails we call them, and this is a sheet of tracing paper that's uh, uh, got some of those little thumbnails on it, and you can gradually, little by little, they look like scribbles to you, but I'm beginning to sort of get some ideas in mind. I do have in mind a particular building uh, in the background that is uh, in this town of Middleburg, and I had that in mind when I started it, and I came up with various ideas. It's, it's not necessarily fictional, but it's an event that could have happened, uh, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. And uh, to do the research, it's a, I went to a museum on Long Island, as a matter of fact, not that far from my home, that had a, a sleigh in it of that period, and then came up with various ideas and angles and eye levels, 
and uh, sources of interest. There, you try to figure out every uh, method that artists have used from time immemorial, such as perspective and linear design, light and dark, uh, color, mm -hmm. so that uh, here the, you, you can see the problems that are, co are coming up in a painting of this type, where I had to figure out that doesn't exist today, the porch that you see mm -hmm. on that building. Mm -hmm. It existed in those days, though, and we knew that from, I forget, probably an old etching or something. And I had to work all of that out and use it to figure out how to uh, get it done. We finally do a sketch with a grid on it that uh, was shown previously, and then get that, uh, when I say a grid, the, the sketch can be about so big with small squares, and then we make larger squares, depending on how big the canvas is, in the same proportion as the sketch. So when you so say we, who's, who's I, I, oh, Yeah, I've been corrected that way all the time. I, I, when I say we, me, I, I do it all. <laughs> right, but I have an office, so I think we've got a team. And uh, well, the team is, is... I'm sure you have assistants who purchase your canvases and your paints right, and your right, supplies. Right, right, right. No, no, sure I do all of the actual mm -hmm. work. I don't have an apprentice or an assistant or anything of that nature. Well, some artists do, so I, I wanted that. to be clear I know that. on how no, you did No, I, I do it all. I found yeah. that... Uh, so here's the finished piece with all so, uh, the pieces put back uh, but together. It, but you start out with little things, and, mm -hmm. and we just showed part of, of the process. Uh, but all these ideas are coming out of your imagination. You're not looking at an earlier artist's version, an etching or wood oh, block print. You're right. coming guess, up with your I ideas, so. yes? I guess so, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've learned from, I've stolen from all the artists of the past. I, well, I that's mean, a great uh, tradition in art, is to borrow and be inspired by artists who painted before you. Who were your great heroes in art? Well, very much the same heroes that Norman Rockwell, who was one of my heroes, mm -hmm. had. Uh, Howard Pyle, Michelangelo, Rembrandt, uh, mm -hmm. Leonardo. Uh, uh, Some pretty big names there. Yeah, well, he, he admired them all. Yes. He, he admired um, uh, Howard, Howard Pyle especially. Also, uh, Arthur Rackham, mm -hmm. who I admire greatly. Um, uh, so many uh, present-day well, illustrators. Well, I think artists are who, always looking at each other's work and, and getting inspired by new ideas. Well, without question, I think that uh, Norman Ros Rockwell is thought of as, as in a very different way than the way I think of him. He is so good, and I think he is great because he is one of the great designers of all time. Everyone says he's a great storyteller, but people do not realize that uh, the head is framed around a window, or, or uh, he uses perspective. Uh, the way Leonardo da Vinci painted The Last Supper, it's one point perspective, and the one point is right between the hmm. eyes of Jesus, and every hmm. visual line leads to it. Well, if you study this, you begin to learn, and Rockwell was such a great designer of putting light against dark, making the most important uh, point in the picture, the brightest point, mm -hmm. it would be like taking a stage full of rockets dressed in white and having one in red in the center, and your eye goes to it. You yes. put her on the end, your eyes your still eyes going to go, go there. there. <laughs> so uh, that's use of color. Mm -hmm. Perspective could be, uh, or sunlight, as in this picture where the light is just hitting the flag. It, it doesn't look um, uh, too good. Here, I don't know if we can tell that way, but it's a, a lot more dramatic on the original picture. And I mentioned Michelangelo. Well, I think that's an important thing that artists have to think about the composition and the layout of their pictures very deliberately and very carefully. It, you make it look so easy when the piece is all done, but you are directing our attention to certain areas well, on the canvas. Well, perfect example is right here with that puddle, designed very deliberately. I know that it rained the night before. How can I use that information? Mm -hmm. And that puddle <clears throat> is an arrow pointing to my center of interest, and the figure accepting the sword of surrender at Yorktown is very deliberately silhouetted against the sky. The flags are very deliberately mm -hmm. silhouetted against the sky. And the only other figure really silhouetted is George Washington, who refused to surrender because Cornwallis did not show up to uh, surrender personally and claimed he was ill. Hmm. And this gets me more to, um, to uh, present day. This is a painting that uh, I am, I'm sort of starting to do um, uh, some George Washington, there'll be a, a a future book 
coming out in oh, 2014 exciting. on my Revolutionary War or New Nation mm -hmm. period. And uh, this is Washington coming home to uh, Mount Vernon after the war is over. And again, it's all uh, imagination of what you feel must have happened or mm -hmm. had happened or probably happened. I very rarely will go to uh, another uh, uh, possibly. Uh, it's, it's probable in, my, in mm -hmm. most cases. Uh, this is another painting that was commissioned by a, uh, a client of Hammer Gallery's uh, of Washington at Valley Forge where Van Steuben is uh, uh, training the uh, troops. And, um, and that leads uh, us to... And leads us to... Perhaps your most epic painting yes, that just yes, was released yes. last year, yes, finished the, last year. Uh, um, uh, yes, there were great... Or maybe uh, this winter, uh, was, just recently. And I believe that the man that commissioned this painting is... is yeah. <laughs> here. Oh, it Tom is a Swazzy masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. And it came piece. about where I really didn't want to do the picture. And he, he, <laughs> he said, but you'll do it the right way. And I said, how am I going to do a picture like that? That's so uh, iconic. It's impossible. And um, he said, you'll, you'll figure a way. I, I said, well, there's no way I'm going to do that unless, I, unless it's commissioned. He said, I, I commission it. <laughs> sort of like Theodore Roosevelt when he <laughs> formed the National Parks. Um, I so do whatever he, he said. But what's very interesting about this... Well, it must have been this, intimidating to do a modern-day version of Washington crossing the Delaware. Well, uh, I think that this is... I don't know if there's anyone that could argue against it, uh, any point that's in this picture because everything is very carefully thought out, including the men on the left side of the boat as we look at it, who would have been kneeling to form a natural railing because they didn't have railings on those... Uh, ferries, mm. and mm -hmm. they ferried across cannon and horses, and my reasoning was that he went across on a boat like that with a cable and a poling, mm -hmm. and I learned this from visiting the site again, which is standard procedure for me at this yes. point, and Tom Swazi went with me on that trip. He mm. was so curious and interested in the subject matter that he knows, I think, more than I do, certainly as much as I do about it at this point. But what's also more interesting, and something that Tom Swazi doesn't know, is that the last advertising painting I did in 1981 was Crossing the Delaware. And I found that out later. And this was an ad for 9X, or one of the uh, um, uh, phone companies. And it's a sort of a comic takeoff. So, so we find of, out uh, that everything it's, it's comes around. But and so tell what's us what's but, next for Mort Kunstler. Well, what's next is really strange because we received a call from a, 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 a worldwide agency, an advertising agency in London. They have offices around the world. It's an American company. I have signed a, a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't say exactly who it is. But they're, um, uh, they called asking if they could use my early men's adventure illustrations and a select group, we have hundreds if not a thousand, uh, as part of an advertising campaign for uh, a vodka. And um, <laughs> uh, it's with a comic kind of a so twist. Maybe this is and inspired by this... Mad Men, a bit retro uh, uh, right. of going and, back and to And they your... wanted this macho kind of a look, <laughs> and it was kind of like um, saving uh, uh, the Sexy damsel in distress kind of with the bear. And, 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 <laughs> and the, uh, the catch line on the billboard is going to read, uh, save more women, drink such and such <laughs> vodka, or uh, a scuba diver with a spear, uh, you know, uh, wrestle more sharks before breakfast, drink such and such vodka. So we're and the looking whole thing at is, a, a, now, a, a now, contemporary um, so, so warrior now, here. So now, believe it or not, they, they um, asked me for certain details that they couldn't find and asked mm -hmm. if I would do the uh, painting for them with this particular expression where the guy is looking right at you and he's suffered through hardship and, and he's done all of this to, I guess, persevere. And, just... and one, of the, one of the lines on the billboard is, ah, just, <laughs> <laughs> and the picture of the bottle. And, and that's going to spin out in a year or so in the United States. All It'll be all over world. the world. Mm -hmm. And I found I became a very good businessman because when they talked about it, and I was quiet on the phone, 
the price went up to where they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> and I have had such fun doing them. I've done seven now. And they take about a, a day or so. Well, fun to visit and, your earlier and, yeah, career. Yeah, I can't believe it that I'm painting pictures imitating my style. Of, uh, <laughs> imitating of, yourself. Of, of, of the 50s and 60s. Well, Mort, thank you so much for this conversation. And thank you for the legacy that you have created for our country and for all of us and to be able to learn history from and to really feel your passion that comes through your work. I guess I have a little too much of it. I'm answering the <laughs> questions before you ask them, I guess. I, I don't seem to be able to control myself, but I'm not thank you, Mort. very good at this. You were great. Thank you. You were great. Thank you.